It's curious times um, and as more information becomes available you have to be able to use that information to be able to make the correct treatment choices um, for patients. The deal though is the information that's gathered is not designed to help you to make decisions for patients. The trials that are predominantly done these days are sponsored by pharma companies and they're designed to show that a new drug is better than an older set of drugs. So now at first relapse of myeloma there are many different trials and data sets available, all of which were designed for one purpose that we need to use the information for to um, make informed treatment decisions for patients when they're in front of you. So really that's what my talk is about. It's about what evidence is there available for first relapse of myeloma and how do you compare between the results. So there are many treatment options. So there is Revlimid and Dexamethasone, which at one way has been a backbone of therapy and is still widely used. There are the two proteasome inhibitors, um, the original Valcade, then Carfilzomib, and more recently Exazomib, all of which have similar but different mechanisms of action and then there are the antibodies with uh, elatuzumab and daratumumab. And so the essence of my talk is, here are the drugs, the triplet combinations on the backbone of either Valcade or Revlimid all work better, but how do you make a, uh, you know, a rational evidence-based decision for patients? And really, like I say, the evidence isn't designed for that. And so the whole um, thought is that medicine is really quite an imprecise science and it's more an art than it is of hard statistics. So you have to look at the patient, see how old they are, how did they respond to the first line of treatment, what was their first line of treatment? Did they get side effects? Did they have peripheral neuropathy? Did they get myelosuppression? How long was the duration of the first response? Because these really impact on the treatment decisions that, that you're making. And each of the drugs has a different set of characteristics. So um, carfilzomib gives really quite deep responses works quite quickly, it's well tolerated, but can cause some shortness of breath. Um, so that's a drug that you might use when somebody's having an aggressive clinical relapse. It looks like when you add daratumumab to either Revlimid or to Valcade, it enhances responses and those responses are quite good. So uh, people are very excited about that. Elatuzumab is a um, very gentle drug. The evidence of its effect is good. It works by enhancing natural killer cells, which is a you know, great mechanism of action. The trouble is, if you use uh, elatuzumab after you've been exposed to daratumumab, there are no natural killer cells left because the daratumumab depletes them. So using elatuzumab after daratumumab doesn't necessarily make sense. I um, see a lot of people who, who live quite a way away from the hospital and for them switching from an intravenous or subcutaneous um, proteasome inhibitor like carfilzomib or Valcade is a great idea. So exazomib is a tablet and you can put people on a, a, an all oral regimen and see them once a month. It's, it's a, you know, that's a big step forward and a, you know, very important for people's quality of lives. So again, the whole point of, of the talk is we have to take clinical decisions based on 
the kind of frailty of the patient, whether they're young, whether they're old. You know, aiming for a cure is not appropriate for all ages of patients if there are side effects. But we have a range of tools now that really allow you to tailor treatment to an individual patient.